Okay, welcome to the Chapter 5 podcast. We're going to be talking about different macromolecules that are found in any living cell of any living organism. So big picture first, if we were to think about a cartoon of a cell that we might see under a microscope, what exactly are macromolecules? Well, they're the components of a cell. So if we could somehow zoom in even further to a cell, we might find that we use models like this to try and depict what those macromolecules might look like at an even smaller level. So I pretended to zoom in here to say a membrane of some kind. There are various macromolecules that we're going to talk about here eventually. Uh, these are examples of phospholipid molecules. Uh, these purple blobs are probably cartoons meant to represent proteins that are also in those membranes. So different macromolecules molecules. If we were to zoom in on those, so let's say I zoomed in on those purple proteins, then we might see that those macromolecules are made of lots of atoms. Each one of these spheres here is an attempt to model a macromolecule at the atomic level. So the black spheres represent carbon, red oxygen, blue nitrogen, and so I just want you to see lots of covalent bonds. Macromolecules are extremely large molecules. Now fortunately we're not going to have to know any atomic structures like this. There's actually an easier way to get to know what some of these mo macromolecules are made of, what they look like, the so-called structure questions, in order to understand how they do what they do. So uh, here's just kind of the basic uh, picture again of what's smallest and largest. And so we're going to talk ultimately about four types of macromolecules. We're going to talk about carbohydrates and fats, also called lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. In this particular video, I'm only going to talk about the first three. Proteins are important enough that they get their own video next. Okay, so before we do that, we're going to talk about some basics, some facts that are true about most of the macromolecules. Everything except fats work this way. So if we don't need to know the atomic structures, then what we can know is a very simple unit that repeats itself over and over again in these macromolecules when they combine to build bigger versions of these. So we have a, a broad term for um, all of them, and the metaphor that I'll give you is that they're like Legos. Legos are very basic units that can be combined over and over again to make bigger structures like say a Lego castle. Uh, each Lego might be called a monomer and then the whole structure that they combine to make might be called a polymer. Poly many. Uh, mono is a root word for one, right? Um, so you got your root words there. So ultimately what we can know instead of memorizing all these atomic structures is we can just know what is the monomer for each one of these carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and eventually proteins. And uh, we can just work with that basic repeating unit. So as it turns out, cells can go either way. Sometimes we might want to build bigger, more complex polymers to make up parts of a cell. Sometimes the cell might decide to break down some of its components back into little monomers so that it can rebuild. Okay, so there's a term for that kind of concept too. If we're combining smaller pieces to make bigger polymers, so here's already a little polymer here, and but let's say we want to attach this monomer as well. Uh, what we're going to find is that anytime we do that, we're going to find OH groups on any monomer. That could be the monomer of carbohydrates, proteins, or nucleic acids. And in order to combine them together, we're going to find that you're going to remove an H from one side and the entire OH from the other side, and that's actually going to form H2O. Anytime you put together smaller pieces to make bigger ones, th this remaining oxygen is what actually is going to be connecting them. So there's actually like a little oxygen connecting the two pieces here. Anytime you put two anytime you put smaller pieces together to make a bigger polymer, you also produce water. So we have a name for this process. We call it dehydration synthesis. Synthesis because we're putting stuff together and we're also removing a water in the process as well. And we can also go in reverse. Sometimes, like I said, the cell might decide to take apart bigger pieces and uh, start splitting them up into smaller pieces again. So it's just the reverse of the process I just described. There's an oxygen in there already holding the bigger polymer together. And a water molecule will actually come along, because there's water everywhere in a cell, and it will be split apart. The H might combine with this oxygen, and that will break apart this bond here 
here, and this remaining OH part of the water molecule will reattach. So we're back to where we started, OH on this side and OH on that side. And that process is actually called hydrolysis uh, because we're going to take a water molecule and we're going to split it. Lice is a root word we'll see a lot, splitting. We're splitting the water and we're also splitting the polymer into smaller pieces. Okay, so now that we have some basics of how monomers and polymers work, we're ready to talk about each type of macromolecule and what their monomers are. So this is actually a picture of many of the possible monomers of carbohydrates. There's a, there's a whole class of them. We don't need to know all of them at all, though. We're just going to give them a generic name in just a minute. But they can look like hexagons in general shape. Uh, you might actually uh, represent them as linear as well, or sometimes they might look like pentagons. This is all a little confusing, but we're not going to worry about these for our course. For the most part, I'm just going to represent monomers of carbohydrates as green hexagons. You don't need to memorize the atomic structure. So that has a name, this generic green hexagon or uh, overall monomer. So they're all called monosaccharides. You might remember glucose is something you discussed in ninth grade bio. That's because we probably just said glucose is the basic unit of carbohydrates. But there are other monosaccharides besides glucose. So we're not going to be uh, talking about very many of them, by the way. So what makes up a carbohydrate? You should be able to tell me the atoms that make it up. C, H, and O is all that carbohydrates have. And lots of OH groups. I just uh, pointed them out there. And why do I point that out? Because that's going to make carbohydrates very polar, very hydrophilic from previous discussion. Okay, so when we start to combine those monosaccharides to make carbohydrate polymers, this looks very complicated in this figure. The only thing I want you to take from it is that we might be able to combine them in different ways. If the OH groups are sort of uh, both pointing down when we combine them, we get one kind of shape. If they're facing in the opposite direction when we combine them, we get a very different shape. And the only thing I want to point out is which way you put polymers together actually gets you carbohydrates with slightly different shapes and therefore slightly different functions. Starch in plants serves a very different function than cellulose does. And so I'm not going to go through some of the functions of these carbohydrate polymers. Those are things I think you can find pretty easily in that section of the text. So make sure you do find these particular carbohydrate polymers and be able to tell me what they do. Okay, so moving on to lipids. Here is a basic lipid. Uh, lipids don't have a whole lot in common. They're a very diverse group. But one thing that does unite them is that they contain lots of CH bonds, lots of CC bonds. And that's going to make them overall very nonpolar, very hydrophobic. They're composed of CH and O just like carbohydrates, but way more C and H than O. Okay, so what are some different types of fats? The only one I really want to talk about a little bit here in this video, at least, are phospholipids. So here is the fat part of that phospholipid. Here's the lipid. They don't show you atoms here, but just take it from me that the black part here are carbons. These little blue spheres are hydrogens connected to them. So CCCH bonds, they're a very nonpolar hydrophobic part. Phospholipids are a little special because the fat is actually connected with a phosphate part. Uh, and the phosphate group, you might remember, has very strong negative charges in it. And that's what's going to make this little part of the phospholipid very polar, very hydrophilic. This is going to be an extremely important component of the cell membrane. Uh, water is going to exist inside and outside of a cell. So it might make sense that the polar part of phospholipids faces that polar water. And that the nonpolar fats are going to be sort of trapped inside, trying to get away from that water that's hydrogen bonding with polar things. That's going to be really important in terms of how a cell membrane does what it does, and we'll talk about that next unit. Okay, so moving right along to nucleic acids. Uh, there are uh, some basic type of nucleic acids, including RNA and DNA, the N and the A standing for nucleic acid. These are both polymers, so if we wanted to see what they're really made of, we might zoom in to uh, them to see what they look like. And if we wanted to briefly look at them on the atomic level, they would look like this. Uh, the only thing that I want to point out, these are carbons, by the way, that they're not showing here. The only thing I want to show you is what atoms they're made of. 
So carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, just like carbohydrates and lipids, but also some new atoms for the first time. Nitrogen, which we're also going to see in proteins, and something unique to nucleic acids, except phospholipids, which is kind of a special case. Uh, but nucleic acids are the only ones that contain phosphorus, so that is kind of unique to them. Okay, so if we kind of zoom a little bit back out, back to the polymer stage, we can find some basic units that are repeating over and over again. And you might see that it kind of is this basic uh, set right here. This is the monomer of nucleic acid. That is what's combining over and over again. And if we were to zoom in on that little piece, we would call that whole thing a nucleotide. That's the overall monomer of nucleic acids. And if we were to focus on what that monomer contains, we'd find that there's three basic parts. There's the sugar phosphate backbone. So here's the phosphate and here's the sugar. Uh, that is sort of what holds the DNA and the RNA pieces together at least. That's just a structural component. Uh, what sugar you actually have in your nucleic acid depends on what you are. Um, and that's what the other letter stands for. RNAs are made of a ribose sugar in their sugar phosphate backbone. And DNA sugars are made of a sugar called deoxyribose. So just know that that's what the letter is. And then uh, there's the third component, the most important component possibly. It's the nitrogen base because that's actually the code for the proteins. That's what nucleic acids do. They code for proteins. And the nitrogen base is what actually serves as the code. So if we were to zoom back out again a little bit, all of these are the nitrogen bases. And, and each there are four different nitrogen bases that can be repeated over and over again. Uh, and rather than draw the atomic structures all the time, we just represent them with a simple letter, C, cytosine and G guanine. I'm not going to write the rest out. Uh, but rather than write out the letter, the whole word every time, we just use the first letter. Cytosine, guanine, adenine, and in DNA, thymine are the four different types of chemicals that exist in the code. Uh, and they pair up a particular way. C with G, A with T. RNA has almost the exact same thing, but RNAs don't actually have thymine. They uh, have a very similar looking chemical, but it's just structurally a little bit different, so we call it uracil instead. Uh, and it still pairs with adenine. It, it, uh, RNAs just don't have thymine. Okay, so there's one other aspect of nucleic acid structure that I just want to introduce, and it's this idea that DNA strands point in a particular direction. Uh, it's a funny kind of notation, but they point from what we call the five prime direction. Kind of looks like five apostrophe, but we call it five prime. From five prime toward three prime. That's like the direction that that DNA strand is pointing on the left. And the other thing I just want to point out is that if one DNA strand is pointing in a particular direction, its pairing strand points in the opposite direction. DNA strands are what we call anti-parallel. They're parallel to each other, but they face in the opposite direction. And the reason why I just point this out briefly to introduce it is we're going to see that this affects how DNA is read and copied later. Um, and so we'll talk about that in molecular genetics. All right, so what's DNA's purpose? Oftentimes we don't need to show the sugar phosphate backbone. We really just care about what order the nitrogen bases are in because you might remember that's how it codes for proteins. You might remember that we sort of read these guys in groups of three. DNA is sort of the master code, and RNA it comes in to copy it. Um, it has most of the letters that DNA does. It's just that, again, A pairs with U instead of T. And then that RNA copy will go and serve as the code to tell a part of the cell how to build a particular protein. OK, so there's actually one other nucleic acid that's worth of, worthy of brief mention, and that's adenosine triphosphate, ATP, the energy delivery molecule for the cell, the instant energy source for cells. It's actually just basically a nucleotide, although it has three phosphates in it, one, two, three, instead of just one like those nucleotides we saw in DNA and RNA, although the other parts are still the same. It still has a ribose sugar, and it has a, a nitrogen-based adenine. So it's just an energy carrier for the cells. It floats around. It's not in the nucleus like DNA. It's uh, floating around delivering energy to the parts of the cell that need it. All right, so when you do your research, you're going to find that a lot of these macromolecules serve the purpose of some kind of energy source for the cell. So I figured I would just create this diagram as a way of, of showing you uh, 
different macromolecules for slightly different purposes. If a cell needs immediate energy, it's going to use ATP. ATPs are going to be spent, as we'll see later. We can, we're, we'll soon find that you can take very simple sugars like glucose and immediately burn them in order to make more ATP. Uh, but if you have plenty of glucose in the cell, you might decide to store it for later by uh, synthesizing it, by turning those monomers into chains of polymers like glycogen in animals and starch in plants. And if you eat a whole ton of calories, you might even take those carbohydrates and turn them into even more stable fats for very long-term storage. All right, so we've done a very basic overview here, and uh, we've uh, covered these topics, and we'll talk about proteins in the next video.